Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Back just before Christmas, there was a launch of an H-3 rocket out of Japan into Tanegashima Space Center. It was carrying a spacecraft called Mitsubishi 5, and uh, you might have heard that it failed. I immediately made a video straight afterwards. What we knew at the time was they began losing pressure in the second stage tank, and uh, the second stage relight did not occur on schedule. My video at the time made some speculation that this was due to a valve failing resulting in a loss of pressure on the stage and that has turned out to be completely wrong. The actual answer is far more dramatic and uh, can be best summarised by uh, the front fell off. So soon after the event, there was a series of images released from onboard cameras that had us very much questioning the whole valve theory. Um, and last night, there was like another presentation with a document released that looked uh, on the progress of the investigation. Now, the document is entirely in Japanese. Uh, you know, there's some stuff that you can very much uh, figure out for yourself. We've got some d graphs about, you know, what happened during the flight. But then you get to this page. And just looking at these diagrams, this is something where you're definitely going whiskey tango foxtrot, even if you do understand Japanese, because what they're basically saying is, yeah, we uh, think the second stage accidentally dropped the satellite on its way to space. The front literally fell off. We have the booster taking off, losing its stages during stage separation. Something ha happens, there's a mechanical failure between the second stage and the uh, the satellite. Now, of course, the booster continues firing at this point. Then during stage separation, this falls off, they separate, and the second stage takes off, leaves it behind, and we had this one image showing the satellite basically getting left behind as the second stage headed off to do its mission, blissfully unaware that it has left its buddy behind. So now I kind of want to go out of sequence with this because I think it's easier for people to start with the cameras because you can see some images of what's going on. So for a lot of the images from the cameras they captured, they're comparing Flight 8, which was the one that happened just before Christmas, with Flight 5. That launched Mishibiki Biki 6, as, and of course the one just before Christmas launched Mishibiki 5. They are very, they're basically the same satellite. I wasn't going to say they're very similar. I think they're practically identical. Same satellite bus and everything. So uh, what you what we're looking at is there are two different cameras, and the the one that showed this object after the engine relit that doesn't show anything on flight five because guess what it actually carried its satellites into geostationary transfer orbit right, um, but the so that's a camera that looks down from the side of the second stage, the other camera which we have far more imagery from that we're going to look at is looking up and it's inside the fairing. It sits on the payload adapter and it looks up so that you can see like the interior of the fairing and it can see the side of the satellite. Now in Flight 8, it's just washed out. Uh, there's light in there. On Flight 5, there is a very well-defined satellite that is visible. So now going back a bit, uh, here's a couple of different angles from Flight 8 versus Flight 5. Flight 5 is on the bottom and what they've done here is they're looking at the camera that's pointing up inside the fairing and they've drawn along the edges of the satellite. And of course, before and after the fairing has come off, the satellite isn't exactly the same place as we would expect it to be. On flight eight, they do the same thing, draw the lines and they find the satellite appears to have moved somewhat. In fact, uh, they think that it has moved towards the camera, so as if it is leaning toward over. So the satellite is no longer fixed in the position it once was on the uh, the payload adapter, which uh, indicates that there was probably a, some sort of failure in the payload adapter. Now, if we go down to the next page, it'll show us how the payload separation, or sorry, the fairing separation sequence opens. This is the fairing that is enclosing the top of the rocket, and uh, as it comes off, something dramatic seems to happen. So we have a series of images running along in this direction. These essentially run in sequence. And they're linked on the timeline here. And you'll notice this timeline also has accelerometer measurements showing like some oscillations, some motions, which are measured from the satellite's uh, accelerometer system. So yeah, you start up here, you've got the payload, and then it goes around. Now these blown out images where it's like gone all white, 
that's actually perfectly normal for a payload separation. If you're inside a payload with some you know, electric lights and then you're suddenly opened up and exposed to the sun, there is a huge change in the brightness, so the camera's dynamic range will adjust. But while it's doing that, you will have these blown out images. Nevertheless, the, the investigators think that they see evidence of debris, of multi-layer insulation getting knocked off the satellite or floating away. And by the way, by the time we get to this last section, they say, it looks like the side of the satellite is opened up. There's no insulation blankets covering it anymore. That's really a, not an ideal situation, right? And if we go down, they also have comparisons to other flights here. And again, you'll see that many of these have blown out images during the early part. But, you know, you can go through these and compare them to see how the one in Flight 8 seems to be, there seems to be a lot more debris going on on Flight 8 versus any of the other flights. So uh, we can take these images and put them into an actual sequence and this is what it will look like running at slower rates than the real thing. Now this whole sequence is covering about one and a half seconds, but it's been slowed down quite a bit more so you can actually see stuff happening. Okay, so let's take a look at the payload adapter that this uh, satellite sits on. This is an image of it on the right here. It is like a carbon fiber composite cone. It sits on top of the second stage and essentially transfers load from the second stage into the satellite. It holds the satellite on. It has to grip it so because lateral accelerations, you don't want the satellite to get knocked off. It also has to be able to release the satellite once the spacecraft reaches orbit so that it can actually go about and do its mission. You'll remember the Falcon 9 and the Zuma mission where this didn't work and a very expensive military satellite remained attached to the Falcon 9 and Old Space were desperately trying to blame SpaceX for messing up the thing, but it was definitely, it wasn't SpaceX's fault by any means. Anyway, uh, I've never heard of the opposite of a satellite falling off extra early. So anyway, this is a sort of diagram on the right side here. What they're basically showing is the liquid hydrogen tank, which is the top of the second stage. There's a cavity in here which they blow liquid nitrogen through on the ground to stop it getting too cold. You don't want like air condensing in there and you know, sloshing around. Uh, and then there's like bulkheads here that uh, you that. Uh, I, I, the hardware and everything is all attached to, but uh, you also have a fairing that covers the whole thing. And here's your fairing showing the separation system. There's a two-part fairing that separates. There's these um, pyrotechnics that activate and then a number of latches come apart and the whole thing is supposed to separate. That clearly hasn't worked. So now... On the satellite, there are some accelerometers that measure the acceleration of the event, of the fairing separation. So that is fairing separation time here, and this is time in seconds going forwards. And one of the things that was pointed out is these peaks in axial acceleration. They're decaying, right? But this takes about one and a half seconds, which is way longer than it's supposed to. Uh, this pink area is believed to be something where essentially the payload fairing, not the payload fairing, the payload adapter is collapsing and getting crushed and then this hits the top of the hydrogen tank and then it you know, sort of vibrates down, rings down here. And so yeah, this is just like a closer view of this particular pink section. What they believe is that I think this is where the payload adapter is sort of collapsing in some form or another, right? So there's like this initial transient event after the fairing separation begins, but then there's this like second jump up, which uh, they believe is, is evidence of, of something breaking. Um, these sensors, by the way, are attached to the top of the payload, uh, like the release system. It's not attached to the bot, the stage itself. So if the top of the, if the satellite moves or the top of the fairing begins to collapse, then these will mo move differently from the rest of the spacecraft. Okay, so the next section we want to look at is the pressurization system. This is uh, looking at how the second stage maintains its tank pressure, because if you remember, part of the story was that the pressure in this liquid hydrogen tank is dropping. Uh, and the way this pressure is maintained is these uh, helium tanks that, uh, you know, by I guess they contain liquid helium. They, uh, are, they run through a heat exchanger in the oxygen tank that warms it up, and then there's this uh, pressure, uh, this is valve, that opens up to let gaseous hydrogen into the top of the tank and maintain tank pressure, right? So 
you can look at all these things, how they operate. So this is like 50 seconds before, 50 seconds after. This is the exact time the fairing operated. So the gray line, for example, is your hydrogen tank pressurization. The blue line is the state of that valve. So it's closed and the pr then suddenly it opens and the pressure in the tank rises. So this is 40 seconds before the pressure is going to be needed. Then the pressure drops off and then the valve opens again to increase the pressure up. And then we get to fairing separation. And at that point, the pressure in the hydrogen tank just starts dropping off. And so the valve, of course, opens up. But even with the valve open, there's just not enough gaseous hydrogen flowing into the top of the tank. The pressure just drops off. And of course, the low pressure on that is why the second stage was not able to relight its engine after it had been in orbit. So if we look at this in a bit more detail, again, we see these uh, same things matched up now with the acceleration. So we have the green lines here are the acceleration. The gray line is the pressurization in the, hyd the hydrogen tank. Um, and this is actually also this red line, I believe, is pressure inside the payload adapter. And what they're basically showing here is at the moment of fairing separation, that is when we began to lose pressure in the tanks. Uh, we also saw some events that were related to activity inside the payload fairing. And this leads to evidence that the payload fairing, or the payload adapter, sorry, failed in some way at the moment of uh, fairing separation. So now putting the evidence together, this is what they think the data is showing them. The, the accelerometers that they're using sit like on this payload interface more or less. And because those move differently from accelerometers elsewhere, it looks like this whole unit sort of breaks somewhere around here, collapses down, hits the top of the hydrogen tank. And of course, you've got stuff sitting on top of the hydrogen tank, valves, pipe, plumbing or whatever. And that results in something leaking and leaking faster than they can restore pressure to the tank itself. But at this point, when the fairing separates, the main rocket is still firing. The booster core is still accelerating. So this just sort of sits there on top of the rocket held there by its weight, more or less, by its inertia. So all that stuff put together is why you get this uh, particular failure. You know, the rocket launches, the boosters come off, the fairing comes off, something breaks in here, but because the booster core is accelerating, that satellite sits on top of it. Now, then there's a moment when there is a stage separation event, right? So there's pyrotechnics or whatever that push the stages apart. But because the thing is floating around in zero G for a few seconds, that satellite, it moves away from the second stage. So when the second stage fires, it leaves this satellite behind and we get to see it saying goodbye and eventually, of course, falling into the Pacific Ocean. But wait, I bet there's a few smart people out there that remember that one of the observations was that the uh, second stage fired its engines for longer so we thought it was just a pressurization issue. Well, uh, that was true. So we can actually see the sort of sequence of events here. We've got the accelerometers here. This is the liquid hydrogen tank pressure, and this is the liquid hydrogen uh, like pressurization system state. Uh, and this is the thrust or whatever from the second stage engine. Now, the blue one is what's supposed to happen. The red one is what actually happened. And you can see the relight of the engine here. It doesn't even start going before it shuts itself down automatically. So that second stage, it was firing longer, even although it didn't have any excess mass, but um, it didn't have the satellite on there. So if it had the satellite on there, this would have probably fired for even longer uh, before it decided to actually shut down. That's really what was going on here, right? Uh, the performance, the pressurization loss on the engine was sufficient to reduce its performance to the point that even although it had no payload to push along, it was still unable to complete its burn to get to orbital velocity on time. Now, you know, you're probably already convinced that the satellite fell off, that the front fell off, right? Uh, but there's one other little piece of data that supports this, which I find kind of interesting, is that they looked at the orbit the spacecraft ended up on, and they figured out how long it would take to re-enter. Now, remember, it was actually observed re-entering over Chile. 
at, on the second orbit. Well, if the satellite was still attached to the second stage, that would increase the mass and therefore its ballistic coefficient would allow it to go through further through the atmosphere, it would actually make it round to a third orbit. It didn't do that, so the satellite couldn't have been there. But the way the spacecraft worked is it would only send the payload release signal when the second burn was complete, but the second burn never was complete, therefore the satellite should not have been released. Therefore, the fact that it managed only two orbits is evidence that the satellite was not attached to the second stage anymore. So yeah, this is one of the more bizarre launch failures I've seen in recent years. And uh, I think the data that they have supports the sequence of events whereby the payload adapter fails in some way, collapses down, damages the top of the tank, and, and, and then the satellite is launched during the staging sequence. But we still don't know what the root cause is by any means, right? It was associated with the fairing separation. Was there something fundamentally in the fairing separation mechanism which damaged the uh, adapter? Was there some fundamental problem, you know, weakness in the adapter that was merely triggered by the fairing separation system? If there was a weakness, was it the result of the, a design defect? Was it a manufacturing defect? Was it introduced during handling and assembly? All of these things will need to be tracked down, understood before they can bring H3 back to flight. And, you know, um, and when people talk about like rocket science and rocket engineering, we all think about, you know, the sexy things, right? The jet, the engines, the fuel systems, the valves, the aerodynamics. Very few people think of the work that has to go into the structures to make these things work. But that's incredibly important. You're trying to make a rocket, a vehicle, which is as light as possible that ha can handle all the stresses. And payload fairing or payload adapters, nobody wants to put a huge amount of budget into those. But if you don't you're going to end up failing your mission anyway. So every single part of the rocket needs a great deal of attention to work correctly. And I have a great deal of respect for any engineer working on design of any of this stuff. I hope Japan gets this figured out and uh, returns to flight with uh, you know, Flight 8. And uh, we'll see another Mishibishi launch in um, you know, some near future. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.